Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Today, we're recording from downtown LA at the World Gym International Convention. With a brand new management team, they have identified what they think are some of the biggest trends they need to be investing in for the future. The event brought together over 200 business owners, entrepreneurs, and suppliers, including some of the top experts to talk about the future. Escape were one of the event sponsors and allowed to record a series of short interviews from some of the talented people speaking at the event that included Dr. Paul Bedford, the retention guru, Guru to share some of his latest research about keeping people in gyms. Jared Sirocco talking about how to future proof your business. Dennis Yu discussing the recent changes in digital marketing and sharing some of the new strategies very few people are using. And finally, Sal Pellegrino from Peloton Commercial, who provides a manufacturer's perspective on the changes we are seeing in the industry. A big thanks to World Gym for being so open and allowing us to do this. So please enjoy this special episode from the World Gym Convention in LA. Jared, the main man. Matthew. You're becoming a bit of a regular on these I interviews, know. aren't you? I'm, I'm completely honored. Maybe it should be the Matthew and Jared. I think so, All yeah. Right, we will work on that. <laughs> so wrapping up the event, Yeah. how's it gone? It's been unbelievable, man. I couldn't ask for anything better, to be honest with you. Um, you know, anytime you come out of something like we have over the last two years and you've got a completely new team and you haven't really met anybody face to face, you never really know how it's going to go. But uh, to be, to say that I'm overwhelmed uh, with the response is, is probably an understatement. Well, I've heard a lot of good things about you. Like, the, I, I guess, and I don't take this the wrong way, but I suppose the World Gym brand had become... You know, it, it, it had sort of aged a bit. Or, you know, good thing is it's it's probably one of the original brands, one yeah. of the original health club chains. But also, I guess it's sort of it, the brand itself had aged. And what I'm hearing is you guys are bringing this whole new life. So tell us a little bit about some of the big changes that you've been launching here. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, over time, we all change, right? <laughs> or we're done. So that's what I always say. We, when you're through changing, you're through. And uh, every business gets to a point where they got to do something. It's either time to adapt, grow, or die. And we were at a critical crossroads coming into even the pandemic, then adding new leadership, then looking at where we were, what are we gonna do? We've been around for 45 years. What are we gonna do for the next 45 years? Well, that two years actually proved really beneficial for us because it gave us time to strategize and, and think about what we wanted to do and who we were gave us an opportunity to look at the market, build a team and infrastructure that sets us ready up or sets us up for the next 46 years. Looking at market trends, looking at consumer buying habits, looking at the way people are consuming fitness now more than ever in different ways. How do we take this legacy brand and don't make it just relevant for today, but for the future as well. And that's what this whole convention was all about. And I feel like we really did something special here. And it seems like they feel the same way. So I'm really excited about it. It's pretty unique because there's a big international presence here. Yeah. You've got some big, uh, who I met last night, Taiwan, Australia, Cayman, there's there's a real mix of people. So what, how, what's, from talking to people, what, what would you, how would you describe the pulse for a lot of your international franchisees in terms of what they've been through and where they are now as a business? Well, I think, and, and this isn't a knock on anybody prior to me, and it's not anything that's supposed to put me on a pedestal by any means. It's not what this is. But I don't think previous regimes really understood their people and the business that we were in. And it's not to say that they were not good at what they did. They have a great skill set. But it seemed like there was a, a disconnect. With the team that we have in place now, we've been those guys. We were owners and managers and operators, and we knew what it was like to do whatever you could to keep the lights on and you know, plunge a toilet and work the front desk and do a training session and second mortgage your house to make, make a payment. And we get that. And I think that connection, that understanding, that uh, ability to put yourself in their shoes really goes a long way. And I think it excites them that we understand them and that we're doing things to support them and help them grow us build, uh, and build a stronger and better business. And I think that's really been the overall message that I've gotten is it's so nice to have leadership that gets it. And I take that as a compliment because we put a lot of effort into building a team 
to support them, and we're reaping the rewards this weekend, and it's nice to see. Yeah, a lot of people have mentioned about some of the, well, a lot of the positive things that have happened since you've joined, and your name's come up quite a lot, and uh, obviously you've done a lot of great things in the industry, and uh, it seems as though now it's the time where all, the, all those things that you've learned, you've, you've kind of put them all into, into, into action. It's come full circle. <laughs> it's been crazy, you know, and as I was saying, it was like 28 years, and I've been pretty fortunate. This, this industry's been great to me. You know, and that's what I said on opening night. It's literally taken me around the world, and now I get to work with the world and, and one of the greatest brands in the world in World Gym. And so it might be a pun, but I'll take it, and, it, and it's true, but I'm excited to be where I am and looking forward to where we go. A lot of people, a lot of your competitors are probably listening to this, and I guess there's some things that you can say and some things you can't, but based on what you can say, and with, this is probably the first place that the industry will hear it. What are some of the things that you've been talking about or presenting at the event that are not top secret? <laughs> um, well, nothing's top secret anymore, <laughs> right? I mean, we're, we're doing a lot of great things, but uh, we're just changing the way we do business because the people who, you know, come to our business has changed. And so I, as an industry, and I know I, I, I make a lot of people mad when I say this, right? We, we talk about the 80% all the time. Well, I've been in this 28 years. We have not moved a needle. That's 17, 18 here or there. If COVID hasn't moved a needle and got these 80% of people off the sofa, why am I going to continue to throw millions and millions of dollars their way in advertising? Yeah, I want to help. I want to help everybody. I don't want them to be active. But there's a group of consumers right now. They're consuming fitness at an enormous rate. And it's not just a membership. It's a program. It's supplements. It's your social media. It's apparel. It's everything. It's becoming a lifestyle. I think on the very first podcast you and I did two years ago in this building, <laughs> I said the gym is back. The gym is cool again. Let's start operating in a way that appeals to these consumers. And if those 80 percenters want to come work out, we're going to welcome them with open arms. They're still going to be there. We're still going to open uh, our gyms to them and build comfortable environments for them. But I'm not going to go spend my money chasing them. I'm gonna work with the people who really want it. And hopefully, other people want it too. And we'll be there waiting for them when they are. Fantastic, thanks for inviting us along, Jared. Thank you very much, man, Thank I you. appreciate it. Dr. Paul Bedford, all the Matthew. way from England, in LA. In LA, not quite as sunny LA as I was hoping it would <laughs> be at this. I thought I'd escape the UK and I'd get here and it'd be bright sunshine and I could hit the beach and it looks like London. <laughs> yeah, it does out of that window, yeah. Does, yeah so. so what are you doing? Like, you're planning a vacation or you're here on business? No, nah, <laughs> vacation. Um, I've been out since the beginning of last week or this week. I've been, uh, the first few days at the Tech Summit in Atlanta, uh, speaking at that, con that conference, and then here at the World Gym Conference here in LA, and then from here I fly out to Chicago for club industry. So it's uh, 10 days packed with conferencing um, rather than being on vacation. Right. What's, what was the tech summit at Atlanta? What, what did you, what were a few of the things that sort of stuck with you that you came from that event with? I think when you listen to all those really smart guys that really understand tech and AI and, you know, data mining and all those things, the thing that I think stuck with me was how important getting the basics right are before you try and escalate your technology. Having things in place, having good, um, good quality data and then a data storage system that allows you to tap in and use the data. It was fascinating to see what they can actually do now. In some ways it was a little bit scary to see what they can actually do. But it, every, every, almost every presenter came back to, you got have good quality data, it's got to be clean data, and you've got to store it somewhere where you can access it. And I think the thing that was coming out was the frustration with operators that they have multiple vendors and multiple APIs and the challenge of getting everything to talk to one another. Um, and while some would like the ultimate program, many of them are saying, actually, we just want things that do one thing really well, but we'll talk to the other things that we've got that do things really well. Um, so I think that's the thing that I would say came out of that. Thank you for supporting the Escape Your Limits podcast. If you're thinking about creating a unique and engaging fitness space to take your fitness to the next level, then we have you covered. 
Escape Fitness design and manufacture some of the most innovative, attractive, and durable functional training and free weight equipment used by many of the best trainers and fitness brands across the globe. As a valued listener, we are offering you a 10% discount off many of the products on our website. You can check out the full range by going to escapefitness.com and use the code DUMBBELL. That's escapefitness.com using the code DUMBBELL. That's it for me. Please enjoy the rest of this interview. With you, you've got, and we've spoke about it on previous podcasts, mm. so I recommend checking out if anyone has the time, but you come from a psychology background. Yeah. And over the last two years, pandemic, people have really Except that that acceleration to digital seems to have kind of you know rapidly changed everything from yeah. move people to shopping, move people to using Zoom who wouldn't normally use it. Even the QR codes made a return. Yeah. Uh, so, in your world, how how do you, I guess, balance this move to kind of a very digital automated world with? what you understand about us being mm -hmm. humans and the psychological part and 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 sort of bringing those two things together in an in an effective way for me i think they complement one another and and i made a comment yesterday to a client and to their staff that i don't think ai will ever get to the point where some algorithm will beat someone else smiling at someone you know, that you can't replicate that experience of a human looking at another human and smiling um, and interacting. What you can do with digital is you can support the, the physical experience. I think some of the digital experiences that were developed during the, the pandemic period were absolutely amazing. You look at the quality of the content that Peloton put out, you know, ignore the share price and how big they thought they were going to be. The actual quality of what they did the approach they used to create the content and the way that content generated a behavior change in people was absolutely magnificent. So I think there's strength in using the digital, but it's got to be used in parallel, particularly for the bricks and mortar operators and saying, okay, what does our digital approach do to support our physical experience? Because at the moment, most of the time when we're looking at digital in the fitness industry, it's all about sales and marketing. It's a tool to do sales and marketing rather than as much as a tool to being uh, creating customer experiences. And so I think what I'm seeing is that as we come out of lockdown periods, the consumer has moved on, but lots of clubs are now lagging. Um, and they're, they're going to lag for a while because the big tech giants can move things forward really quickly. And if me or you ever an Apple experience or a Google or an Amazon experience today. We expect our clubs to be able to do that as well. And often the clubs just don't have the budget, the resource, the manpower, or even the understanding of what to create. Mm. Before we started the interview, I said, what are some of the things that were on your mind? Yeah. Um, some of the things you're talking about here. And you mentioned the pre-pandemic mindset. Yeah. The, the the pivot and now where we are now. Yeah. Um, what what I guess I'd be interested in is 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 some examples of of without necessarily naming names, yeah. but some examples of what what typical businesses you feel have done in terms of you know have have a lot of them did a lot of them make progress. I know I feel that we made a lot of progress, but have, have they sort of now everything's back to normal? Have they almost like forgotten that and reverted back, or have they kept a little bit? How would you? to assess that. Okay, so the, the way I think about it is this. During the pandemic, people had to work really hard brain-wise, mental capacity. They had to shift things every day. There were things changing. The rules today aren't the rules tomorrow. Aren't, and it was just constant. And that, that creates a huge cognitive load. You felt tired at the end of the day. Yet you look at what you'd actually done. It was very It didn't feel like very much. Coming out of the pandemic, one of the easiest ways to relieve that cognitive load is to go back to doing what you know what to do. So I think of it as a pendulum. During the pandemic, we swung one way and we had to work really, really hard. As soon as restrictions were lifted, we just most clubs and most operators have just swung back to what they were already doing. The difference is the consumer has swung a little bit further. And so now some of our offerings don't align with what they value and then and trying to get some of them back into our clubs is going to be a much bigger much bigger challenge 
they're still physically active, but they've moved to doing something else for their activity. And I'm not just suggesting that's all gone online. Mm. People have started walking, people have started doing other activities, particularly to get their cardio. They can't get their strength, you know, often in any other environment than within the four walls. But for a lot of their cardio activity, they're looking for other alternatives. And I don't think, I think now we're playing catch up in terms of cardio, and particularly in the female market, whether it seems that a lot less females have returned as quickly as men have returned. Mm. One of the things I remember talking to you about, because you've done a bunch of really cool training for Escape Fitness over the years, and I, I remember us having a conversation about this pattern interrupt. So yeah. on, a, on a very small scale, if you've got some sort of habit or addiction, you break the pattern, and if you do it so many times, you yeah. kind of permanently don't, don't go back. Yeah. Through the pandemic, I, I guess that there's been this massive pattern interrupt for individuals where we probably had these automatic patterns where we'd finish work and we'd drive yeah. here and then we go to the shops and we do this. So there's all these automatic patterns and probably in a lot of cases, we didn't even question them. We just continued to do them. There was no reason to ever stop. Yeah. So if you apply what's happened to your background in psychology, yeah. um, do you think some of those patterns have been interrupted permanently and and then as business owners you know how do we then kind of catch up to where pe does, pe where people are does that mm -hmm. kind of make sense yeah yeah no completely and i do think i think the pandemic for a lot of people was a massive pattern interrupt not just to their exercise but to their life and there were lots of things they missed out on during lockdown and i know in the uk you know there's um people talking about the amount of people that went on holiday vacation as soon as they could. It was like, I've not been able to go on vacation for two years. I'm going now, no matter what. And everybody left the country. With a behavior like exercise, it has to become a routine and become a habit. It has to be something we have to do weekly. We got out of the habit of doing it weekly. And I know at the early part of the pandemic, I was saying to people, if you're gonna run online um, group X or anything, schedule your class at the same time you'd normally schedule it so if monday night is the night when you do pilates put monday night at six o'clock pilates is when you do your online program because that's where people still fit in but i think the pandemic went on so much longer than any of us thought it would that what's happened is it's almost like if you think of a, a bowl of water and our hands in the water when we're exercising we've pulled our hand out and the bowl of water doesn't notice we've gone because it's just filled in the gap. Mm. And I think people's lives are filled in with ec without exercise. So one, one of the things we'll have to do if we want to get those people back is we need to do another pattern interrupt and shake them. I don't think the vast majority of people that have not come back have lost their identity as exercisers. I think they still think themselves as exercisers and they might still be exercising. But we have to show them the link between how good exercise feels and what we're offering because that's what other people are doing at the moment and i think we're just going we're open you know and it's that field of dreams if we build it they will come we're open why aren't you coming back well actually because i'm quite enjoying walking the dog you know which is what i'm doing for cardio at the moment so we have to create pattern interrupts and some of those pattern interrupts can be done using things like a lot of digital media but messages that of people who you might have seen in the gym before back exercising oh look they're so and so but we need to make an effort because they won't come back naturally not initially you know we might have to wait a year two years and i don't think a lot of businesses have got that amount of time right. you work with a lot of great brands around the world what mm. are some of the things that you you're when you work and consult with people what are some of the things that you do and you know how do you how do you help different organizations mm -hmm. in the fitness space i think the first thing to do is recognize um you know where you are in that fitness space i hear a lot of rhetoric at the moment about we're not in fitness anymore we're all in wellness i think that's rubbish there are businesses and brands that are our fitness they're fitness through and through and i think we don't need to be apologetic about that you know I wouldn't say CrossFit was a, well, in the wellness brand, yeah. Does it contribute? Yes. Is it a wellness brand? No. So why, why pretend we are? I'm not saying CrossFit are pretending that. But why brand, brands going, oh, we need to be this? Be really true to what you're good at make, and then get your members aligned against that. If they want other services, I think what we're seeing is, and I'm saying to my clients, you have to now think of being share of customer. 
you won't own the customer totally, you'll own a share of the customer. And you'd know that at Escape because you don't provide products and services that fulfill the whole bricks and mortar experience. You provide you know, brilliant products that fit a certain niche. So you share the product within the business. And I think operators need to think, actually we're sharing customers now. Customers will do some bricks and mortar stuff, some digital, and some non-digital, non-bricks and mortar, probably just you know, out in the community. So just to wrap up then, mm. uh, you're back in America. If, if people are interested in finding out a little bit more about you, yeah. maybe getting you involved, uh, how can they find you? And when are you back specifically to the US audience? You're doing yeah. a little bit of a... Well, at the moment, yeah. yeah. So as we're filming, I'm here for the next five days. Um, I'm going to be at Club Industry, and if anyone's at Club Industry, um, this is probably be gone. It might be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you were at Club Industry, maybe great. you should have come and said hello. Um, but that doesn't matter. You can get in touch with me at retentionguru.com. My phone number and my email address are all there so people can get in touch. They just reach out. They just reach out. Um, I've got a lot of work planned in Europe between now and, and, and Christmas period. New Year, I'm probably back in March. I'm definitely back for Ursa, and I'm planning to stay a little longer than the Ursa period because I've got clients that I'm seeing in both Los Angeles and San Francisco in that time. So if people want to say, look, while you're out here, you know, it's not far to get to Baltimore from Los Angeles, not in my world, <laughs> um, then just reach out and get in touch. But in the meantime, get in touch to talk about 2023 because we're, we're moving into Q4 of this year. And I'm already having conversations now about projects that are Q2 next year. We usually step back from Q1 because people are doing their sales processes. But Q2, Q3, 2023 is when I'm actually talking to people about work now. Great. Thanks, Paul. You're welcome, Matthew. Enjoy LA. Thank you. <laughs> Dennis and Gavin, World Gym Conference. Uh, that was a pretty fantastic uh, presentation you did there. So uh, thanks for coming along. Thank you, Matthew. And I'm going to take uh, one of your tips from the session and your Grant, Grant Cardone little clip and sort of go in with something that's going to get people's attention. Yeah. So I want to ask both of you. So one quick tactic that anyone who's listening to this can sort of amp up their social media. What would be one real simple thing that a listener can do uh, that's going to make a difference to what they're doing on social media? I'll start with you, Gavin. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, the number one thing I would say is most people, when they're on social, they're thinking about, okay, what am I going to say, which is amazing, because what you're saying in the video matters a lot more than all the aesthetics and to get a 4K shot or whatever. But that first second, first one to three seconds, that's the most crucial. And I think most people, they have good content, but they don't know how to capture attention. They don't know how to do hooks. And the easiest way to do this is go to your safe videos on TikTok or YouTube Shorts or whatever it is and just pause them right as they stop, look at the first frame. And then what is happening in that first 0.5 seconds? That's most of the time when you see videos with millions of views, they usually hook your attention right away. So if you can master that, especially when we're moving a lot more into a short video form economy, it's, uh, yeah, that's one of the biggest things or whatever your message is, your expert, awesome, catch that attention first so that way people can actually hear what you have to say. All right. What about you and Dennis? Mine is take your phone. <clears throat> This is an iPhone, and capture little 15-second videos. Anytime something happens. So I know some people, I coached a guy yesterday, I won't name him, but he sets aside four hours every Friday, and that's his recording time, and I said, no, don't do that. When you get the idea, it could be in the shower, when you're working out, when you got lost and you know had to jump over a wall to, to find your way back to the hotel, that's a perfect moment to capture that story, because it's out in the wild, it's not in the same background with this same podcasting and the same look and the same feel that gets real stale so i'd literally do this on the phone and i record a video saying something like matthew tell me about that time you got lost and had to hop a wall and got scraped up right okay i do that's good that's good you remember that actually <laughs> I, was, I was running around a golf course and uh, did get lost and and, the hot uh, sun and all that and yeah. so we tell the story like that and so a lot of people know that they could do that if they just get over their self-judgment. And then here's the second piece to go with that. Because that's being saved right here on my Apple Photos or the iTunes, this is automatically being categorized. So this is the thing I see gym owners, entrepreneurs, everyone, they miss this one step. They need to make sure it's being categorized inside Google Photos. Okay. So now with Google Photos, because who do you think has the best AI for facial recognition and just processing people and places and photos and all that, it's Google. It's not Facebook, it's not TikTok. 
So name any kind of place, name anything, name any activity, name Los something. Angeles. Los Angeles. So when I do a search on Los Angeles, I have everything here that pops up in Los Angeles, exactly where in Los Angeles, who I'm with. So I could say Matthew Janusek in Los Angeles, and all of this stuff will be here. So two things. One, I'm recording short form video, 15 second stories, just a moment in time, capturing it here, not trying to be perfect. Two is it's all being stored and categorized. So how do I do that? Because I'm going to do that when I look. So, so this Google thing, because I save it on. Okay. So on iPhone, it, it yeah. puts everything in. So here. on iPhone, you, you pay for iCloud. So yeah. if you drop your phone, it's all already in the cloud. So that's what this is. So all of these things from the last couple days. So my buddy, Tommy Mello, who does a billion dollars a year in a home service business, I was with him yesterday. And all of these moments are being captured here. So there's, there's me and Tommy, and this guy does 1.2 billion. This guy does 1 billion a year and we're capturing these moments. Now, Apple's facial recognition, they may recognize that this is Tommy, they may recognize this is Josh, but what happens is, so I'm paying 10 bucks a month for Apple, but I'm also paying 10 bucks a month for Google Photos. All right. So people would say, well, if it's being stored on iCloud, why would I spend another $10 a month for, for Google? Because I want Google to do the categorization for me, and I'm spending 10 bucks a month for Amazon, and I'm spending 10 bucks a month for Dropbox. So I'm spending $40 a month for four different places to all store my videos. Why? Because now, at that moment we just captured, I don't have to do anything. Now our VAs come in and they have access to my files and folders and it's automatically tagged. So the system automatically knows what you look like. So if I come into any of these systems, I go into Google Photos and I search Matthew Janusek, that's gonna show up with all the other things that are automatically tagged as Matthew Janu said. Okay. So now I've eliminated all the friction necessary to be able to store, manage, share, whatever, my content. The biggest hurdle I see for entrepreneurs and figureheads and business owners is getting that content over to whoever's doing the processing. It could be a virtual assistant, someone on Fiverr, could be an external agency. I don't want to have to, you know, me as a busy entrepreneur, like we're flying out in half an hour to go to Pakistan. I don't want to be uploading and categorizing and giving directions and having a meeting. So literally all the content I make, I literally just make it and that's it. I don't Can you automatically it. save on this on Google? Automat that's what I'm saying. Right. I'm looking for zero friction. I literally just want to make content. I want to manage relationships, you know, do the stuff that I do, have nice dinners, you know. And then nothing else. I literally want to do nothing. I want to have zero friction. I don't want to upload stuff, I don't want to tag stuff, I don't want to go to a project management tool, I don't want to have any meetings. I just want our people who are, are working, so they're in the Philippines and Pakistan, whatever. I want them to be able to log into my Google Photos and notice like, oh, looks like Dennis and Gavin were just with so-and-so. And then they know what to do because they already know all the other content that we've co-created together. They already know about Escape Fitness. So they, that so The team that's working on Escape Fitness will automatically know that. They'll know that you're with Chris Voss talking about, you know, how do you negotiate a hotel rate or whatever it might be. And because it will automatically tag and, and, and then they will just look at similar content and yeah. then they will work that out themselves, is that kind So of most people, when they think about Amazon, they think about like, you know, one click and purchasing things and all that. They don't realize, like Amazon does facial recognition and looks at photos and pictures. Google already does that. People think of Google as like the search engine or Google Maps or Gmail. Google's engine, this brain, is recognizing everything that's on your phone if you give it access and pay them the 10 bucks a month. Why not let them do the work for you? So one of the things that, so to slightly change, because we've, we've not got a huge amount of time, one of the things that I picked up this morning is you were talking about Amazon, you were talking about um, Google, you were talking about Facebook, Snapchat, all these different platforms. Yeah. But, but you're also sort of explaining that if you understand the sort of principles, which is similar to what you've explained here, then you can you can manipulate all of them. Like tell yeah. me, so 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 they're using the same kind of brain or yeah. or t talk about that a little bit. And right, what so that means? Here's here's the secret. So me as a search engine engineer, I'm one of the few people on the planet that can actually say this with credibility. They all use the same algorithm. So when you're on Amazon and it's recommending other things that you should buy, when you're on Netflix and it says if you watch this show you might like these other shows, when you're on TikTok and it's making recommendations in the feed, that's the same algorithm. That's called a collaborative filter. So my buddy Lee Wei Ma has three PhDs, and he wrote the algorithm that recommends for iTunes what songs you should listen to. Pretty cool, right? That's really powerful. You never know. I mean, the guy speaks like okay English, but he's really, really smart. Like, we'll get together at lunch, and he'll explain this crazy statistic. He has multiple PhDs in statistics, right? 
and it's all based on a collaborative filter. A collaborative filter is basically a look-alike. It's a reverse Bayesian filter that says people who like to do this also like to do that. So think about when you're on Facebook. It's trying to show what your friends like, trying to show what you might be most interested in. Think about when you're listening to a song or you're buying a product. All of those are using the exact same algorithm, right? So when you look at it from that lens, every single social network, every single shopping feed is all exactly the same thing. It's based on the exact same math because it's trying to drive engagement. Higher engagement means higher monetization. 70% of the people that, that go to Amazon.com end up buying something. Isn't that crazy? Because the system's so smart. TikTok is super addictive. People will say it knows how to read your mind because it's doing the exact same thing, just with a different data set. So when we were having dinner with Randall Pitch last night, he said, he asked me, Dennis, is it true that TikTok is doing facial recognition in the videos and showing it to other people who are friends of there who recognize those people? And I'm, yes, it absolutely is true. Wow. It's the same algorithm that powers all the social networks. So moving on from that, or, or sort of similar topic, but Gavin, you were talking about if you want to now promote something, so I'm, I'm sort of moving on to, to content yeah. and, and, and linking it back to what Dennis said. So you, you were, we were just talking off camera and you were saying, look, now, um, what, was it, what was this sort of, uh, what, 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 what was the description you called it? You said it's like user, we, we were talking about apparel. Cis. Cis. Yeah, what, yeah. What's cis? So especially on platforms like TikTok, I think that cis selling is the best way to sell. And what that stands for is seamless integration selling which essentially isn't selling. You're just putting things, like for example, there's a girl who was just telling a story or whatever, I can't remember what it was, but she was using this wireless like hair like a straightener. And everyone in the comments, they weren't talking about what she said, they're like, oh my gosh, where'd you get that from? But she said nothing about it. She was just using it as she was telling the story, right? And, and I promise you that store sold out. I promise you, because I've seen this happen. I have friends who run these e-commerce stores and when their things hit on TikTok, it's a huge revenue spike. And that's also how you can build brand. So we talked about too, how essentially, you know, you look at Nike, right? And LeBron James and these different people built Nike. And I know Dennis knows a ton of these after working with these companies and all these things. And that's what makes Nike. Nobody wants a brand, wants to buy that brand because yeah. the brand's great. They want to buy the brand because they like the people that's right. that make the brand. Right. And they can't be LeBron James, like Dennis says, but they can essentially get that feeling of, you know what, I am something that is whatever they like about that person or people yeah. who are associated with that brand. So there, there's that point in TikTok, but the question then becomes, okay, well, that's good, but how do we get people to wear? Or how do we get like our product or our service talked about or mentioned or seamlessly integrated into these videos? Yeah. And that's where Dennis's dollar a day strategy comes in so handy because you send someone free merch, awesome. They get tons of free merch sent to themselves. So let's say, but, let's say you, you've got, like use it in this context. So you've yeah. got a, you own a gym, okay? Yeah. Uh, so how could you then, sort of put those two things together? Because I, I kind of yeah. got a good understanding of what Dennis was talking about. H how would those two areas connect from sis to dollar a day then, yeah. if you own a gym? So, so I'll start with the merch, because I think it connects okay. best with that. I'll make it concise. Essentially, merch, I think, is really good because it's just there. It's seamlessly integrated, right? Um, so, well, good, so you'd wear your world gym apparel? Yeah, well, you'd send it to people first. But it's like, OK, for example, if I sent you free Gucci, you'd wear that, right? But if I sent you a free brand you've never heard of, you're probably not gonna wear it. So if you can run dollar a day to target these people in a micro fashion, let's say you get one influencer, maybe you paid them, maybe you didn't, to wear your brand and rep it, whether they're working out or whether they're whatever, you use that creative to target the influencers that you want to rep your brand. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, this is a big brand. I see them everywhere, this is cool. I'm actually gonna wear this thing that otherwise I wouldn't have wore. Right? And you treat them well, you send them some nice things, whatever, build that relationship. Now they're wearing it in their videos and people are asking, where'd you get this, et cetera. And there's ways you can integrate that into the gym space, which I'm happy to share as well. But that's like the general concept of how that can actually come to fruition. Yeah, exactly. It's using the customers to do the work for you. So gym owners can obviously boost posts that are made by their members, which is the whole point of UGC, instead of like brand created content that looks like a yeah. commercial. But like yes. to what Gavin's saying, we can go a step further. So when someone's wearing that gym hoodie and they're just out on the beach or doing something but not in the gym, that's, that creates more trust actually. It seems odd because they're not in the gym because it looks like that person's not intentionally trying to sell. Just like the yeah. woman who's curling the hair. Yeah. She's not promoting that. It creates so much trust because they're talking about another topic. Yeah. And all the studies in psychology show that when you distract somebody with something like solving a crossword puzzle 
while you're subliminally playing certain kinds of music or showing a particular brand, they trust that brand more. Right. Versus like having them focus on the brand. And so you said, which I don't think a lot of people are aware of, but if you've got someone that comes into your gym or wears or uses your product or wears some of your apparel, you don't have to now pay for an influencer and send it to them and pay this. There's a different way of doing it. Just give a brief overview of how you can sort of get their code and yep. do yep. that. So one thing first is that we're not trying to become mega influencers and have 20 million followers and get brand deals. If I'm a gym owner and I'm just trying to get more butts in and more members to sign up, I only need to win in that city. So in that city, there's restaurants, there's real estate agents that are well known. There are, you know, buildings or arenas or there's, there's landmarks that people know. There's a park that people know about. So if I have my members and they're checking in at these other places, and if I have my team members or people at the front desk and I just capture these ordinary everyday moments that are not about advertising and then I run dollar a day targeting just people in that area, targeting the entire area, not trying to micro target, I'm going to win because people will see me everywhere. You guys have heard about six touches where it takes six touches. People have to be exposed to a brand six times, like six, you know, they Super Bowl ads, radio, TV, whatever, until they buy. Now in digital, it's 30 touches. It takes 30, people need to see a brand 30 times before they buy. So we, how do we get the, those reps in? We need to show lots of lightweight content from a wide variety of people so everyone in this city believes like this is the dominant gym or this is the one like everyone's going to this gym, monkey see, monkey do. It's literally just hitting them with enough frequency. Right. That's what we're doing. So the whole dollar a day is getting anything that mentions World Gym or mentions my brand out so that everyone in just that city can see it. It okay. creates this immense social proof. And you also said that you can actually boost their posts yep. for them. Without so when you even... see someone that, that, that you know, tag themselves it on you know, Instagram, they check in, because there's sort of like a vanity thing, like, hey, I'm working out, I'm up at five in the morning, or you know, I lost some weight, whatever it might be. Then you can reach out to them saying, hey, wow, that is so awesome. I like that thing that you posted on Instagram yesterday. I would love to spend our money to boost your post to get your profile higher. So on TikTok, they, they're smarter than Facebook and Instagram because they realize, you know, it's really hard to use the branded content tool, which is what Facebook created. You get to go through all these steps. Instead, if it's on TikTok, you reach out to that person saying, hey, this one particular post I like, can you go click on the three dots on that post and give us the access code? And if you give us that access code, that gives us the permission to boost your post. Why not? Right? And you make a little one minute video, a little explainer saying like, this is what happens when you give us the access code. This is how I'll use it. This is how we're featuring your brand. So you could, you could arguably use people that have not got a mega following, but just do a really yeah. nice job and look yeah. really authentic. And, you, and so for them, it's like, okay, well, that's great for me because yeah. I'm gonna get more yeah. exposure. Um, yeah. Okay. So, it, yeah. I was gonna say, yeah, with this strategy and CIS essentially with Jim specifically to tie it all together, okay. it's um, you don't have to be some huge brand. If you make good content, you have a good following, even if it's in a small local area, whatever it is, you can amplify their ads that way to more people. And the cool thing is you're amplifying their organic content because the last thing you want is for something to seem like an ad. When it seems like an ad, that's when the performance plummets. Yeah. You know, there's super direct response stuff you can do, but for when it comes to building brand and getting more people and building that culture and making it cool to come to your gym, you want to show cool people in your gym, but you want to show it in an organic fashion where it doesn't yeah. come across as advertising. You're just amplifying what's working on their behalf. And, and, and then you could, I suppose, if you do have some you know, cool hoodies, you could send it to it, say, look, thanks, oh, yeah. by the way, yeah. and then they could, if they wanted to wear it or not, they could yeah. do, but it's, it's more kind of authentic, I suppose, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Right. I'd have every new member have one of these hoodies, because anytime they make a video about anything, if I can find them, if I can do a search for World Gym and that content comes up, then I can boost that post if I get their permission. So I've had, so I had a meeting with TikTok, and ByteDance, which is the parent company that owns the TikTok brand, and they told me 70 cents of every dollar is being spent on the um, Spark ads, which, which is the boosting post of boosting other people's posts. Mm -hmm. And it's so smart. Yeah, the the reason why TikTok advertising has now surpassed Twitter and is about to surpass all these other guys, there's more searches occurring on TikTok than Google. And nobody, none of the other platforms are doing that. They, yet, they don't realize this. Wow. They don't realize TikTok knew that there are these creators, or not influencer people, not people trying to become influential, but just general people who are just wanting to share their lives. If we make it easy for brands to be able to harness the content that, are, that the customers are already making, that's where the advertising is. Because yeah. the brand, the gym owner, you know, the 50-year-old white male doesn't want to be the one getting on TikTok right. and dancing and singing and all that. 
And then people probably don't want to watch the 50 year old male either, but right. you know, so it's, it's, that's, uh, that's powerful. Yeah. Well, look, I think, that, I think we couldn't have packed in any more value in that. So <laughs> thank you so much for your thank time. You. Um, if anyone wants to kind of connect, give, a, give us a bit of a, where can we find more out about what you're doing now at the moment, Dennis? Just, just Google reminder. me. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, you know, whatever it is. I built the analytics at Yahoo 20 some years ago. That doesn't exist anymore. So just Google me. I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. Fantastic. Well, thanks, guys. Thank Good you, luck with your trip to Pakistan. Amazing. Very <laughs> thank much. you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Ciao. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for sitting down with me. I've been watching you forever, and I'm honored to be here. So, World Gym event. Yeah. Okay, you've done, we were talking off camera about these uh, sort of su supplier events that we, you know, we, we end up doing. What, what's, what was different about this one then on your, on, from your perspective? Yeah, well, I thought uh, Jared did a great job in prepping for the show. A very different, share the direction of the brand, where they're going, what they're doing and they implemented uh, the speed dating format versus your traditional trade show, trade show hours that no one shows up for, you know what I mean? So uh, I was thrilled with it. That, uh, and then I was, was the fashion show last night cool or what? Yeah. I'd never been to a fashion show, so <laughs> it was great. I enjoyed it. Uh, so anyway, I, I just thought it was, it was terrific and the meetings were good today and uh, dialogue. I had discussions with people that I've never had a chance to talk to before. You know, so from that perspective, it was very good. Very, very good today. So excited for where, the, where they're taking the brand and wish them lots of success. You know? So how, how long have you been involved in the industry? Uh, a long time. You ready? <laughs> My birthstone is lava. <laughs> no, so. But uh, I started, uh, I was a club owner first, which most people don't know. So I started in 1979. I had Nautilus clubs. If you remember that. So when I hear Jared going back to strength only, my first two gyms were strength only. Nautilus circuit. So here we are, you know, back to the future, right? I mean, and it's just it's pretty interesting. So I started uh, working uh, for Stairmaster uh, as, uh, in 1984. That's why I sold my clubs to my landlords and uh, and uh, been doing it ever since. So it's kind of fun. Stairmaster brand, Precore. Pretty, two two good good brands to, to yeah. carry during that time, you know. So, what would you say are some similarities to when you got in in the early '80s, and what would you say are some of the big changes since that okay. period? That's a great question. Um, in the '80s, we had fun with fitness in a big way. '80s was was a great time here in the U.S. Uh, Hollywood was into fitness, and you know, there's a lot of celebrities were coming on board. Clubs were beginning to pop up and grow, uh, and we didn't have the sophistication of the facilities and technology that we have today. But you had to rely more on interaction, having fun, treating people good, greeting people, and so that that was one thing that I thought was very, very good. I thought we lost track of that in the last ten years a little bit. And I don't know if that was the advent of technology or whatever, but now, I think post-COVID, now connection is more important than ever. And I think people have picked up on that, both the operators as well as the members coming back. They sought that interaction with people mm. and how important that is. So I, I think that was, that was one, one, one change for me. And then obviously now, you know, going from high service, to kind of low service. Coming back now, we're seeing it, you know, coming back to service levels again uh, and trying to figure out how to get the, what I call the COVID cautious member, how to get them back. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm looking forward to Paul Bedford's talk tomorrow. Right, I'm I just telling him earlier, right? Yeah, so. I'm really excited that he's here, you know, so. Uh, but anyway, so that, that was probably the biggest difference from you know, then to now. And what about probably, I'll, I'll go to pre-pandemic, so people coming to you, you've, I'm sure you've designed hundreds of facilities and, and advised on them. What would you say that you're doing differently now to probably what you was before the pandemic, whether that's from an equipment perspective, a design, user experience? How, how have you probably rethought your role and position uh, you know, in, in, in the space? Yeah, all right. Um, I, I like the way you frame that. Um, you know, the pandemic was interesting. So let's go back 2019. Best year I ever had selling, pre-course banner year. I mean, just was great time. January 2021 was great. February 21 was great. 
March, all hell broke loose, right, of 2021, <laughs> uh, 2020. And then, and I'm sitting there watching this, and I'm saying, oh my God, they just shut down the country. My, my customers, they can't operate. And I said, well, no one's buying equipment, so what am I gonna do? So I started watching all the webinars that were going on, and I sat back and I said, who is coordinating this information and distributing it to my customers? Because I know they don't have the time to put the effort in what I'm listening to. I'm listening to seven to 10 <laughs> webinars a week and then taking notes on it. So I came up with the Monarch notes for those things and I did my little weekly talk. Yeah, I remember, talk, they were okay? very good. And they were, they were terrific, you know, and I did 42 weeks in a row with wow. that. And then, um, but that was probably, I, I, I say this to people, 2020 was the worst year I ever had financially, meaning, because obviously your commissions are way off, right? But it was the best year I ever had professionally because I stopped to think about me and what my goals were, and I just thought about the customer. Mm. And that changed my whole perspective on business. And the customers looked to me as, I mean, I was getting texts from CEOs of companies. This is the best seven minutes of my week. Don't stop, you know, that type of thing. And when you know, you're getting that stuff, and all of a sudden you're building relationships with people that you never had a relationship with, they never bought from you before, but now I'm connected with them and whether I earn their respect by doing something unique and different. But I, I think that was probably the big takeaway for me for COVID. You know, share what other people, you know, share the, the collective wisdom, mm. I guess is the best way to put that. I, one of my customers shared this. He said to me, I hope when the pandemic's over that we don't stop sharing our collective wisdom. And I really like how we frame that. Because guess what? We stopped sharing our collective wisdom, right? Yeah, and exactly. Right? So we need to go back to that. And so that's why I love things that you're doing and, and uh, you know, a thing like speed dating today. You know, I, I just shared a bunch of what, what Sal sees. And we had to great engagement because of it. Because people stay in their, in their own little world. You know, they do. They stay in their club. They're not out there. They just don't have the time or whatever. But uh, I think if you can share what you see as a good industry advisor, uh, it, it bodes real well for, yeah. for, for, for the trust level for people, you know? So anyway, it's, it's been good. The final question, I want to ask you about sales. You've, you've probably been in sales for more lifetimes than a lot of the people have been in and out of sales. Mm -hmm. you, like you've, you've had a lot of experience. Yeah. And my guess is that when you started, the, the tools that we had available, well, I know were, were very difficult to what, what we had today. If you're giving advice for anyone really, I suppose, whether, whether colleagues, other people in the industry or other people are coming in sales for you know, selling health club memberships or anything, what would be one of the most important things that you've learned throughout your career as it relates to being, um, being successful in selling? Mm -hmm. Um, from an equipment standpoint, I'll start with that. Okay. okay. Yeah. I always tell young people, you got to be relevant, you got to be trusted, and you have to be consistent with everything that you do, the whole process. Okay. Um, people buy from people they like and trust. So if you lose that, your, 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 your career is done. Because guess what? People talk. <laughs> all right. And now you know, because of social media, people have a big voice. Right. So obviously, uh, I, I think that's that, that relevancy and that trust factor of being transparent is very critical. Let's take it from a, uh, a health club perspective. If I'm selling memberships at a, at a health facility, just be nice to people. People forgot how to be nice. I don't know if it was the COVID craziness. I don't know if it's politics. I don't know what it is. But no matter where I go, People are angry. I don't know why. I don't know what it is. But be not make it fun. Make it enjoyable. Make it memorable. And care about the customer. I, I, I treat my customers like I work for them. I'm not going to recommend. I'll, I'll give an example. I just redid a, a club for a gentleman. And it was a refresh. And I went from 60 cardio pieces to 38. And he goes, dude, you're a sales guy. And you're selling <laughs> cardio. I, you don't have enough half racks. You don't have enough, you know what I mean? Let's, and cardio is off right now. So let's, let's wire still, but you don't need to spend, you know, 22 treadmills today. Let's go to 12 or 14. And he just looked at me, shook his head. And he goes, yeah, you just saved me a lot of money. I said, well, you know, I'm pretending my, your club is my club. You know, so I try to design things that I, that I see trends, try to put that in my, in my planning with them and share with them what I see, 
in the marketplace. And that's, that's really done very well, very, very well for me. So I, and you know, following you, I, I love following trendsetters that are smart, that, that are sharing good ideas, sh sharing collective wisdoms, and sharing things that are successful because that's how we all get better. You know, rising tide, right? So, so anyway. you're going to do more of those? Um, well, now you're again? putting me on. Now I'm on camera. Sure. I think I, I need to do that. A lot of people enjoyed you know? those. So maybe I, mean, I was getting uh, posts that I mean, uh, views that were just off the hook. Yeah. You know, and um, and then what happened is I started selling. I didn't have the time to devote to. But yeah. you know, maybe there's a. I couldn't do it weekly. No. Maybe I do it monthly or something. Yeah. That's a good. That's a good. You challenge. should do it. I, I, I enjoy right. it. I think it's uh, and and. And I know we've got another. We're running out of time, but I do think it, you know sales has changed. Be, be, sure. be, you know, people haven't got the time to meet as they did. People don't pick up the phones like they used to. The younger people don't even, you know, take emails. It's text sure. and social sure. media yeah, yeah, and that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. what they do all do is they they are on social media. And I guess you know you were certainly in a lot of people's feed every week. And you know you say people buy from people who they like and trust. trust. And right. It's a great way of building a connection and trust. I, I will say this. <laughs> Don't be afraid to try new things. I mean, like, I didn't know how to spell Zoom, right? And I got really good at it, you know what I mean, from a selling perspective. And so I, I think using technology to your advantage is a great way to sell. And, yeah. and I respect you for doing it because I've got, I know a lot of younger people that should be doing that because sure. it's their generation. It's not the generation you were from. No. And, and to, 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 you know, step out your comfort zone and to, you know, give the young ones a bit of a run for their money. I, I respect you a lot <laughs> uh, I, you know, I saved the first video that I did. I saved it. And it was hilarious. I, I listened to it about a month ago. And it was, how, uh, uh, is, is it me or I'm in a good space right now. The country's locked down. My workouts are great. I'm eating good. What are you doing for workouts? And, I was, and that was my first post. And all of a sudden, I got like 900 views. And I went, holy mackerel. <laughs> and then a friend of mine who's a techie, he says, Sal, don't worry. Everyone's, everyone's locked down. You're not that good. <laughs> I thought that was great. He goes, but do it again next week. Yeah. And that's how it started, you know? And it was just, and then, and then it got to be, you know, my wife would say, hey, honey, you got you to gotta film. It's Get 2 o'clock. <laughs> I would try to post it every Sunday by 3. You know, it was really funny. Well, but, thanks very yeah. much for everything Thank you, you man. do. Cheers. Yeah, great it's to really see great. you. Yeah. Jeannie. Yes. Passionate about fitness. Absolutely. How have you been doing yourself? Are you, uh, are you a sort of an avid fitness person as well as owning gyms? Or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my start was actually in group fitness. So I did start as a fitness professional and uh, I, I kind of got bitten by the, the bug and uh, continued a full career in fitness. So yeah, definitely. So how did you go from fitness trainer to fitness owner and operator yeah it's just one step at a time i guess and um, was that always was it always a dream to have your own gym or uh i would say that it was a dream to always have like a self-sustaining business i've always been passionate about um business in general and uh the the, the pairing between fitness and business is kind of like a, a really a nice mesh for me it kind of it clicks all the box i guess you can say so yeah, definitely. And where are your clubs? We have our fitness centers are in Quebec, okay. Canada. Yeah. So you guys have been for a pretty brutal time uh, in terms of being yes. allowed to open and operate. Yes. So did you totally close down, and or were you able to sort of no. get around? We pivoted right away. Okay. We knew that um, it wasn't going to be. We knew that it was going to be a game changer, and we knew that we needed to innovate and act quick because uh, our our mission is to keep our members active and we knew that we weren't going to let them down and that we, even though our gyms were closed, our mission was greater than the closures and we decided collectively that we have a responsibility towards our members and towards our staff to continue to promote health and wellness even though we were discredited as a group and we felt like it was our responsibility to continue our mission and, our, and promoting fitness and making sure that we weren't going to let our people down. So we created different campaigns and different strategies to really keep members active. We created even social platforms for people to connect with one another, even though the gyms were closed, because that's a huge factor of why people come to gyms, is to connect with others. And so uh, we, we knew that we were all in it together, and we literally called a, a social platform around that title. All in it together, we created 
different things like podcasts. We did, um, we hosted uh, nutrition workshops online, live group fitness classes. We did pre-recorded workouts through, through our app. Uh, we hosted live workouts. Lots of different things to, to keep the mission moving forward, yeah. How long were you actually meant to close down for, like where you can go into the, into the facility? We were closed for uh, on 18 months, approximately 13, 14 months about wow. on 18. We were closed more than we were open. And we were open and closed throughout that period like four different times. So at, at some points we were open, we were allowed to open for about three weeks, and then we faced an additional closure after three weeks of operation. And so we had to we had to be resilient and super focused. <laughs> yeah. And we had to keep the morale high for everybody really because we're kind of like the cheerleaders, I guess you can say of the community. You know, there's the firefighters, there's the police officers, there's all these essential workers, you know, the, the, the nurses and the doctors and fitness professionals as well, because we kind of serve as that for people, the outlet where they can come, it's like their second home, right? And so everybody lost that. And we had to find a way to, to stay pertinent and to stay as, you know, an influential provider to people's life and to say, no, we're not gonna let you guys down. We're going to find a way and we're going to come to you. So we just became an integrated part to their homes. And so our coaches, our fitness staff, our professionals, we all kind of came together, our managers, our leaders, and uh, we, we made it happen. So we were on target and uh, we're quite happy with what we were able to, to achieve. Yeah. Did you lose many staff? We did lose some staff. Yeah. We did lose some staff, unfortunately. Yeah. And how have you done with getting people to come back to the, to the business? Yeah, naturally, I would say that people were drawn to the gyms. Right. And uh, we, we have a very nice community around each of our clubs. And uh, people were ready to support us. We, we did get a lot of support from our members and our staff. So we've been very blessed. Yeah. Would you say that that, that building of community was an important part of getting both members and staff back because I, I speak to a lot of people and that's yeah. been a real challenge to yeah, be honest absolutely. but I, I guess did, did you by staying open and connected do you think that was like the glue that kind of kept that support for what you guys were, were doing yeah absolutely absolutely I think that we were successful in really maintaining connections you can say mm. yeah we didn't want to just turn out the lights and you know, see you when we see you. No, we wanted to remain, remain as an important service provider to our members and our and our team members as well. And, and it, as much as we helped our members, as much as they helped us, because we we were hopeful. You know, it, they gave us hope, and uh, yeah, we can't thank them enough for the support. Definitely. Yeah. So, Dr. Paul Bedford, I interviewed him today. He's going to be doing the opening talk tomorrow. And we okay. were talking, or he was talking about how people have broken their habitual patterns through mm -hmm. the pandemic. They found different things to do. They, yeah. they were maybe working in different areas. So, so when they come back, or the ones that do come back, they're, they're, they're slightly different. Well, they are different people than what they were before. Yeah. Have you found the, the people that have come back are looking for different things or expecting different things of you as a as a brand than what they had done prior to closing? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I feel like they're definitely they they have expectations for sure for quality standards and things like that. I think that people know what they want. It was interesting to see upon the reopening. Uh, we did see a, a, a nice influx of. Um, the, the kind of new generation, I guess you can say, of fitness users. And they were very vocal in the importance of, of our services and very supportive of us. So it was kind of interesting to see like a, a shift in terms of demographic. And um, we did see a lot of new members coming through the doors, the young people coming in. And uh, that was kind of nice to see, yeah. Mm. yeah. Would you say that with a lot of the online options that had been available over the last few years that the consumer is more educated than what they were before? 
Yes, I would say that. And, and they have a lot of uh, a lot of fitness solutions available at their fig fingertips, <laughs> literally. And so for us, we've been uh, we've been quite good at incorporating different different fitness um, resources in inside our inside of our clubs. Right. So members can have the full experience. You can say, yeah. Final question: What have you taken away from this event? Have you seen? You've been with the World Gym brand for quite some time. Yes. Have you seen it evolving? Has there been any interesting things that you've got over the last couple of days that you're? Absolutely. I think that uh, the World Gym brand is um, getting stronger and stronger, and um, with the new leadership in place, I, I'm really excited for the future. We are, you know, I think just getting started after 46 years, but <laughs> I think it's, it's just, we're just getting started. And so we have a lot more people to help. And uh, I think for us as, as a mission to make fitness accessible to all and to make sure that people feel welcomed in our centers, you know, and yeah, just we're excited to rock and roll and to continue to grow and help more people. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank yeah. you very much for your time. Thanks to you. Samuel, World Gym Convention. <laughs> um, Cayman Islands. Yeah. Now, I, I thought that's a place that when you've made loads of money yeah. and you kind of want a place to store it and yeah. when nobody can get hold of yeah. you. Is that, is that what happens there? Um, yeah, partially. Yeah. <laughs> There's some loopholes, yeah. So how do you end up in a, with a gym in the Cayman Islands? Um, well, World Gym Fitness Center in Cayman is where I grew up basically starting there from the age of 10. And um, I would wait for my dad after school. Um, my father was a very consistent person. And um, just growing up there, people would just encourage me. And when I became of age, I mean, I was under everybody's wing, all the top bodybuilders with all the experience. And um, I got to basically like benefit off all of that. And just moving forward, the gym just reshaped my life. I became more disciplined. Because after 90 days, I was willing to stop. My dad said, no, you're going to continue going to the gym. At that point, I became the most improved student in my high school. I won the Governor's Achievement Award. I was living a much healthier lifestyle. I became prom king. And, you know, five years ago, I became, became owner. So right. it's, been a, it's been a wonderful journey. Um, I feel self-actualized. Um, I, I don't want to do anything else. I just want to own gyms. <laughs> so what, what made you want to own one though? I like, I get being passionate about it, but what was the, and, and when you, two, top, double question, what made you want to own it? And then secondly, once you, once you sort of had the keys and it was yours, did your view of owning a gym change at all? Um, so one, how did I get into ownership? Um, 20, I was, it was 2016. I, um, I was really looking at my life and um, the trajectory of it. I was into the private sector, I was doing accounting. I got accepted to the Board of California to set my CPA, just like my dad, just like his older brother. I'm next in line, and I knew then I didn't want to do this for the rest of my life. And um, I, I, I was working for a big four. I, the employment ended gracefully. Um, also, some of those partners are members of my gym and support me in other business ventures that I'm doing, so it was, it was a good fabric. Um, and I wrote down things I was most passionate about, and I tried to formulate um, that into a business and then structure it into a sequence. And um, I was gonna get into real estate because I figured I could make profits and then buy the gym. To be clear, the gym wasn't for sale. I just wrote down what I was most passionate about. And um, I spoke to the then, the then owner who had known me for years because of my history there. And um, I just mentioned it to him, and um, I saw him again at the gym um, in passing. And he inquired about it, and um, I couldn't believe he was taking me seriously, and um, he did, and, and I got my attorneys and my, my lawyer, but it all started with a vision. I said exactly how I saw World Gym in the future, and I think he was sold at that point. The acquisition happened, um, and I think from that point forward, becoming an owner, it's, it was surreal for me, still is, you know, considering my history, um, but I feel we're, a lot of people think about business as if you don't have any practical experience, having ownership is just latitude, leisure, profits. It's a lot of hard work. You gotta stay successful. You have success factors. You have to be plugged in. Um, and I also feel responsible. I feel responsible for my staff. I feel responsible for my members. And um, I have to be forward thinking as well. 
I think also as an owner, I try not to, like Jared referenced earlier, um, I don't focus on my competition. I focus on my strengths. And my job is to keep them worried about what I'm doing. And um, they, they all, because we're, we're so, so long standing, they kind of look to us first, see what we're doing. And But I agree with what Jared said earlier. Like, um, it's all about just playing to your strengths, staying focused, staying consistent. The future is now. And it's no time for complacency. Yeah, so I think this is one of my success factors is the support that I get from World Gym, my, my personal drive, and ultimately, I'm as good as my team. Right. Yeah. So you mentioned that um, you, hadn't, you didn't plan on buying the gym. Did, uh, my, my guess is buying a gym isn't something that you do with your you know, spare money. Yeah. Did, was, it, was that something you, you lined some money up ready to make an investment, or did you have to go out and raise money to do that? Yeah, so um, I use leveraging. Um, I didn't know how I'd go about it, but I started to educate myself. 3.30, 4 o'clock every morning, some brewed coffee, how to buy a business. And I started to try and pivot everything in. I started talking to the banks and I'd you know, go with what I had. And any feedback I got, I, I wrote it down and I made sure I made that amendment and I kept building it out until the point they said, man, you're so organized. And um, you know, I had, to, I had to pull some strings. I had to come with a really, really, really good business plan. And um, I had to be um, convincing as possible. And I got one yes after five no's. And um, you know, I've gotten a full ROI in 1.7 years. I got all my money back. 1.7? It was less than two years. Wow. Yeah, the business grew 30% more profitable each year than I found it. Even when we were locked down for 108 days in um, 2020, I still, to my shock, was still 31% more profitable than when I found the business. So I've, I've grown the um, customer base, needless to say. Um, but yeah, I, th I think as, as another success factor is to keep a laser focus on your customers. That's the most important piece of the puzzle, respectfully, because if you know staff is important and showing up to work on time and cleanliness is everything, but you've got to have those members coming through your doors and you want to have attrition and you want to f figure out ways to get new blood. One way I did that was to introduce a 24 seven access. Um, we weren't 24 seven before. Um, I feel like the, the point of view was incorrect. I, I welcome opinions and discourse and different points of view. We can all grow. Um, but I felt like it was a huge mistake. And that was where my teeth got really big when it came to the investment side of World Gym. Just knowing that there was a huge market out there that wasn't subscribing to us for all but one reason is that we weren't 24 seven. And um, my view was if we did hit the switch, we would increase our market share. We would gain more market share. There was another position which um, I think hindered the company where, well, if we went 24 seven, our light bill would be higher, our water uses would be higher. I don't see the point. The cost to benefit was very favorable. I don't think they looked at it from scraping more market share into the company. So um, I think those things were um, success factors for us. I didn't rush to drive prices either. I just tried to offer more value and um, educate the coaches, educate the staff. Um, but yeah, it's just been a relentless process. But I feel like when I was in accounting, I used to quantify my hours like an accountant should. I'm an entrepreneur, I work more, longer hours, and I'm not quantifying my weeks or my months in terms of work. Um, you talk about leverage, and it's something I've been studying. I started my business really from a, with no money and slowly built it, and that, you know, it took a lot longer, and, and I've had some people that help, helping me really understand the benefit and the power of leverage. Mm -hmm. With a small business like yourself, one location and a relatively small team, you said focus is important and yeah. focusing on your customers and really figuring out how to optimize that. You also mentioned that you're looking at the second location, bigger, so my guess is there's an element of going out, raising money again, and, and, and that's a kind of slightly different place to put your energy. Yeah. How, or have you, have you thought about how you'll look, you know, sort of continue to move your existing business forward and then have that focus on uh, raising money, getting up and running and, and doing everything with the second location without taking the focus off your current one? Um, 
I'm going to be working with Jared. Like I said, <laughs> you're, you're as good as your team. So I know the World Gym franchise is able to build out a whole box for me, so to speak. And obviously we can cooperate. Um, also being in ownership, I'm in a position where I can get latitude if I need it to, to focus on, on getting that done. When it comes to leveraging, um, I've kind of learned what the banks want. And one thing they do want is real estate. So I've actually purchased two acres of land. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, also, I'm actually doing a development. Um, I'm building 18 units, going 30. I've sold five pre-construction. I haven't even gone to market yet. So um, this all paints a picture mm. of what I'm doing. So, so you're kind of, you're using money, making an investment in property, which I guess is a harder asset for people to lend against. Exactly. And then generating additional income. Yeah from that to put into the to the business that's yeah. very smart yeah and um some of those units will be free and clear as well once it's all done so, right yeah. so what's the what's the vision like you've got a great brand that you're working with and you've already got a, you know success under your belt where you're a very young lad what's your what, you must have a clear vision what's what's next on your uh, on your list um, in terms of business ventures? Business, yeah, business goals. I think for me, my life goal is to be able to comfortably retire at 40 and live life to my standards. So right now I'm just trying to um, work towards that. So I have a running coach, he passed, God rest his soul, his name is Derek Lerner. But this is almost like the mantra for my life. Set a long-term goal, then you set a series of short-term goals to get there. So I'm working towards that number. Um, I'm not sure if I'll retire at 40. <laughs> I don't think I will, but um, yeah. I, ideally, this is a bit of a stretch, but it's okay. I can talk about my aspirations before I, before I pass. While I'm above ground, I would like to own, even if it's 1% of a basketball team. Basketball team? Yeah, I want to own 1% of an NBA team, right. at least. And yeah. which one, like if you had to choose one, I'm sure you got a bit of a favorite. Mm, there's a couple, honestly. Um, <laughs> I was looking at, okay, my favorite team right now, hmm. I can't say I met I met Jason Tatum at my gym, and any any NBA um That'll any be fine. NBA team yeah, <laughs> yeah, any NBA team for sure. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, thank you very much thank for your you. time. Best of luck for the, for the future. Thank, thank you. you, Nicole. How's it going? I'm good. How are You're you? You're a different person than yesterday. Yesterday it was kind of very tense. But <laughs> today you look much more relaxed. Yes, a little bit more. Everything's on time today. All right. How's it gone? It's good, good. I think a great opportunity for all the vendors after a couple of years of not being in person. We're finally in person again. And I think everyone's really excited for it, which is awesome. So you focus on a lot of, when you're not organizing events, you focus on opening clubs for a lot of your franchisees. Yes. What would you say is uh, some of the biggest challenges that people have when they're opening a club? Um, well, obviously, finding the location and, and build out and uh, finding the right demographic and all the analytics side um, is a challenge, especially if you've never had a business before or never opened a gym before, that side of it. Normally, we're on the fitness side hmm. and not on the business side. So obviously, with World Gym, we give them a lot of assistance and have a lot of great vendors that offer a lot of assistance with data analytics and everything to just ensure before we even open, we're in the right spot, right location, and uh, be the most profitable for them. Are there any, without, without sort of mentioning that your, your brand does this, but are there any common mistakes that people make when in that pre-opening stage? I think not doing their research and not, maybe not accepting help and, and really just, you'd want, you want to know everything. You'd rather have information overload and know everything from your competitors and every aspect of the business and then you can make the decisions going forward. So probably not doing enough research, I would say. And once the doors are open, what's, what's that like? Is that generally smooth going and effortless or are there some kind of, uh, hurdles to overcome during that period? I would say we have it down to a pretty good science now. Um, we, we've opened enough of them and again work with a lot of great people in, on our team. We have a lot of experience with opening World Gym so we have it pretty much down to a science right now. Obviously last minute there's things that go wrong that are unavoidable but I don't think there's too much that we haven't seen before which is good. And, and what, would you, what would you say sort of makes a successful grand opening? Building that community beforehand and then obviously the pre-sale process. So I, if you're in a facility or a space that, a town that hasn't had a world gym in there before, 
before you even open the gym, you almost have to build the brand and, and explain a lot of people have obviously heard of World Gym, but let them know that you're coming to town. What are you going to do differently? The fitness market is pretty saturated. Um, so what is our gym and this gym and your gym going to be different than everyone else? If they have a previous gym membership, why should they switch? If they don't have a gym membership, why should they join World Gym? So just setting that that mark on the town and creating that, that atmosphere and that community before you even open will like make your grand opening, like just go off in a bang, which is awesome. I've, I've, it's been talked about a lot, but first impressions are lasting impressions. And what I suppose when people come and check out a new club for the first time, that's really a big part of their decisions are gonna be made then. What, what are some of the things that you can do once you've opened to help people feel that this is the right place for them and, and, and ensure that it's not just a free trial and they come in for a couple of weeks so they actually stay and become long-term members? I think what a lot of people make the mistake is when someone comes in for a gym and comes in for a gym tour, you just kind of show them everything in the facility. And why stop and ask them why they're there. What do they actually want to see? If someone wants strength equipment, then why maybe not bring them to the cardio section or the group fitness section. Or if they want group fitness and I'm going to put them in a squat rack, maybe that's not the best spot for them. So I think a lot of people get paralysis by analysis and overload. And it's like 25,000, we have a 100,000 square foot facility. You walk in, the amount of information that you're trying to perceive and, and internalize is, is massive. So take a second, understand what they want and how we can be most beneficial to them and help them. What's their why? Why are they there? Why did they decide out of every, all the days that they're going to step into a world gym and make the decision to change the rest of their life today? So what is that why? And then show them that why. So, yeah, personal training, you know, is, is it still important? And what, what are some of the, you know, how, my guess is I understand that it's tough to get trainers mm -hmm. and it's, uh, it, it's, it's a very competitive space. So how... What, what do you have to do today to be successful at personal training? Uh, again, I think listening to their why. There's so many different trainers out there. There's so many. You can go on YouTube or you can go online and find a video for free. So why am I going to pay for that service? What makes you different as a trainer? How can I help that person in, in every aspect of their life? It's not just the hour workout that they're with them in the facility. It's the accountability. It's the support. It's the knowledge. It's giving them your all. If you've been a trainer for 10 years, I'm trying to give you 10 years of my knowledge in that one hour session. So how can I teach you and listen to what you want to achieve and work with you with the knowledge that you're going to use for your rest of your fitness journey. I, I understand that also some of your facilities around the world have a very mixed demographic from very young to, to pretty old. In terms of personal training, how, is it, how important is it for the trainers, whether in, in terms of their age group and profile, to be able to align and connect with the different demographics that you bring into the, into the club? It, it's definitely important. Um, uh, we work with the trainers too, like every trainer, if you have a certain background, a certain certification or certain knowledge base, run with that. Go with the people that you are going to connect with the most, that people are going to connect with you the most, um, whether and that translate on the business side for your marketing, how you market yourself as a trainer, but also your members. If you have a great connection with that person, people will buy the person. Definitely, it's important to know your market and continuously educate yourself and grab a different a base of education and from all aspects. What about on the trainer side? With a lot of the trainers leaving and thinking that they can make a lot more money on their own because they don't have to share that with the clubs, what would be a reason that a trainer should work within a brand like World Gym? Well, some of our facilities do offer online training. So we do have that option. Um, some trainers, it's a great opportunity. They have in-person clients and they also have online clients. So we cover that basis. And some people are busy. Some people travel for work. Some people, you're in town for three weeks of the month and one week you're traveling. So how can I continue to hold you accountable and assist you while you're traveling? And, and maybe we're doing virtual sessions or Zoom sessions. So we do offer that service with World Gym too. Right. And is it, do, what, what do you think in terms of, um, I, I guess 
choice is to make, you know, do, do you still feel that for trainers it's it's worth being part of a bigger brand as opposed to just going it a lot going it on your own? Are, are there other things that you just can't get if you're if you decide to be an independent trainer? Would you say? There's pros and cons, obviously, but a lot of trainers got into the industry because they love fitness. When you go out on your own, it's now business. It is marketing. It is sales. So do you have that experience? Do you have that knowledge? Are, do you have that those personality skills? Are you going to educate yourself to be able to run a full business, marketing, sales, all on your own? With World Gym, you have a team. You have support. We help make you educate you we have world gym university that has multiple different videos and platforms and we do monthly coaching series and everything to help assist with that side of the business because they usually get in there for the training so yeah we remove all the maybe little headaches from the online side so it would depend on if they wanted to do that on themselves or not i suppose it's an interesting thing that like it like any business you go from being a, a, a single person entrepreneur and you can you can do really really well I started like that you can make a lot of money and then suddenly mm -hmm. you have to oh, I need this person now and I need that person and so suddenly your margins and your profitability it's like actually I was doing you know way better before but but the problem is you can never get beyond that certain point and I, I, I get what you're saying is that okay well I'll take on some and do my marketing and my bookkeeping and, and this and that and suddenly you end up with uh, you know, less less money than you started. So I, yeah. I, I can kind of see the benefit of uh, of that if you if you can get that right balance, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. So final question then: What would you? You've spoken to a lot of people here. There's a couple of hundred people from how many countries from around the world would you say are here? Do you know? Oh, uh, there's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> we have um, Australia, we have Germany, we have Cayman Islands, we have Taiwan, we have Brazil. Um, Canada, US, so literally all over the world. Right. What, what would you say after talking to a lot of people that you have? What, what would be one message or, or learning or lesson that, that you probably have taken away from the, from the last couple of days? I think like family and connection. Like we, World Gym, we've been the OG brand. We've been around for since 1976. We've been around for a long time. The brand has evolved and we have evolved and the industry has evolved. And now that we've taken all this experience from the past and what we've learned, like how can we all come together to just go to the next level and help each other? Like we went through the last couple of years by ourselves and how can we just be a team and a family and, and grow, like I said, with each other and learn off each other, which this weekend I, I keep talking to everyone and that's not only all the presentations but just sitting down and having conversations with people and building that connection and maybe someone that when you're having a bad day you could pick up the phone and be like hey remember that conversation we had at the convention and we really connected and that's something that world gym i think does one of the best in the industry excellent well thanks thanks for inviting thank us you. over thank you thank you hey i hope you enjoyed this podcast if you did then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.